Welcome to the John Brown University Chapel podcast, recorded in the historic Cathedral of the Ozarks in Salem Springs, Arkansas. This week's chapel speaker was me. I am Tracy Balzer, and I'm the Director of Christian Formation here at John Brown University. My name is Tracy. I've been here for a long time, and, and in uh, my whole professional career of more than 20 years, uh, I've been a, a campus minister, I've been a professor, I have a class today that some of you will be in, um, and I've also been an author. And uh, so, so words are really important to me, and I also find them really interesting. Well, this week, kind of a funny thing happened at our house. We have one granddaughter, Lizzie, who's four and a half. Of course, as all grandparents do, they think their grandchild is an absolute genius. Uh, but she was walking, she was hanging out with us at our house and walking through the house with me, and all of a sudden she said to me, hey, are you going to read that book to me? I said, oh, what book? Now, this is an unusual question because she does love, you know, like all children do, they love to be read to. I said, what book are you talking about? She said, you know, that book, that book that you read to me at the cabin. I was like, oh, That is a while ago, because that was at Thanksgiving. We were together at our family cabin, and I was reading this book for myself because I needed something like light and enjoyable to read. Can you see what this is? The Princess Bride. (laughs) And uh, she saw me reading it. And so first of all, yes, genius child. She sees this sitting in the living room. She's like, oh, are you going to read that book to me again? It's like, oh, amazing that she remembered that. I said, sure, I'll read it to you because, yeah, back then she had seen me reading it and I thought, this is good. I'll find a good bit of this. This is an adventurous, exciting story. And so I remembered reading to her, you know, finding the bit that was the most exciting. You know, when Princess Buttercup is presented to the kingdom and then she's kidnapped by three brigands, the Sicilian, the Turkish giant, and the um, expert swordsman Spaniard, right? They kidnap her, um, they tie her up, they throw her in a boat, they sail across the water, they're chased by the man in black, and then suddenly Princess Buttercup jumps in the shark-infested waters. And this is all of the, you know, while they're on their way to the cliffs of insanity, right? So this was great fun. So I thought, sure, I'll read that to you again. And I opened the book, and she says to me, is this the part that uh, has the cookie? Like, so much for genius. I don't know what she's talking about. (laughs) I have no memory of a cookie in The Princess Bride. But we get to the place where Princess Buttercup is swimming in the shark-infested waters, and here's what it says. Then the sharks went mad. All around her, Buttercup could hear them beeping and screaming and thrashing their mighty tails. Nothing can save me, Buttercup realized. I'm a dead cookie. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I guess she's a genius. (laughs) I mean, it's funny how in such an exciting scene that Lizzie fixated on that word cookie. I suppose it's because she had never really heard it used in that way before. You know, the phrase dead cookie, that's kind of a strange phrase. And for all I know, her little active brain has been puzzling over it ever since. Well, our semester's study here in chapel is going to be the book of Exodus. As you know, we heard President Pollard speak to us on Tuesday. And today, in chapter 3, we get some pretty interesting words and word combinations. Now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush, that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. 
When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go, assemble the leaders of Israel, the elders of Israel, and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you. And I have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So like I said, uh, there are a number of interesting words and word combinations in this rather long passage, and we're going to go through just a few of them. So first, burning bush. Now specifically, this is a bush that is on fire, but that doesn't burn up. This is almost as strange as a dead cookie. But it gets Moses' attention. I am always intrigued personally by sacramental concepts, when something outward and visible is a sign of something uh, sacred inward and invisible. The burning bush is certainly one of the most powerful symbols of God's presence and holiness in scripture. Another pair of words, holy ground. Another contradiction of terms. I mean, how can dirt be holy? Well, let's talk about that word holy. Because in the the words uh, of Inigo Montoya, We keep using that word, but I don't think it means what we think it means. Yes, it can simply refer to that which is sacred, but in the Hebrew, what it really means is that which is set apart for a unique purpose. And I find it really interesting that the first time this word is used is in Genesis chapter 2, when the Sabbath is a day that is set apart to be holy, set apart for a unique purpose, for worship, for rest, to release control, a day to give to God. We believe that Moses wrote those words, that he wrote all of these words, that he wrote all of the words of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and he talks about the Sabbath as holy. Interestingly enough, he doesn't use that word holy again until this point. Gen, um, Exodus 3, holy ground. And after that, the word holy is mentioned numerous times, telling us that God is really up to something. We will read many times as we study the book of Exodus about a holy people, 
a holy nation, a holy place, a holy dwelling. God was indeed up to something, and Moses gets the first glimpses in this chapter. And I, like I said, we're going to hear about it all semester. Now, as for holy ground, we know from the larger council of Scripture that all ground is holy because God is there. And it is especially so when we join him there, when we join him in that unique space where he is there at work and we join him in his work. The poet Elizabeth Barrett Brown, Barrett, Elizabeth Barrett Brown's often, often quoted poem says, I don't think I said her name right, I'm sorry. Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Her poem says it well. Earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God. But only he who takes off his shoes, the rest, but only he who sees takes off his shoes, the rest sit round and pluck blackberries. I'm gonna read that again. Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes, the rest sit round and pluck blackberries. So holy ground is everywhere. Now, um, so those are a couple interesting sets of words. Burning bush, holy ground, they seem contradictory, but here they are in this fantastic story. But let's look at Moses himself um, in this chapter. There are a number of uh, verses in this chapter that tell us quite a lot about Moses, and let's look at them. In uh, chapter 3, verse 6, at this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And in verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? In verse 13, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And in chapter 4, verse 1, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say that the Lord did not appear to you? Here we see Moses expressing very freely a lot of insecurity before God, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear. I would like you to take a look at just those four statements. Which of them would you say that you identify with most at this moment in your life? Are you afraid to look at God? Are you feeling insecure about your ability to do what God is asking you to do or what you are being required to do? Are you uncertain that what you say is believable? Do you really believe that God has anything to ask of you? So take a minute and look at those and choose one. Just last night, I read a post by a psychologist friend of mine who specializes in stress and trauma. And she rightly identified what we are all dealing with right now. One thing is decision fatigue. How do I plan? When so much is unknown and uncertain, do I attend this thing? Do I cancel? What do I do? Just yesterday, a couple of speaking opportunities that, that we have were wiped off the board. Second thing is hypervigilance. Hypervigilance, she says, refers to a state of being that includes a heightened awareness and alertness to everything going on, either in or outside. When we are in this state, we feel as though we are at risk and perceive both real and imagined threats as looming large, which triggers our central nervous system to go into fight, flight, freeze, or faint mode. That's hypervigilance. And then the third thing, a word we use a lot, burnout, but I really appreciated her explanation. She said, we feel a deepest sense of not enough when we are burned out and our emotions are blunted. We lose interest and motivation and often feel incapable of or disinterested in meeting life's demands. 
My friend then goes on to give lots of really wise counsel on how to deal with these challenges. So if you're interested in reading that, please send me a note and I'd be happy to send that link to you. So here is Moses maybe experiencing some of that and he's having an honest conversation with God, dealing very openly and freely with his own fears and insecurity. So then what happens? In this passage, we see that God responds, because this is a conversation, God responds with a lot of his own words. He says in verse six, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In other words, I am the God of everyone and everywhere forever. In verse seven, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. In verse seven again, he says, I am concerned about their suffering. And in verse eight, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land. And then finally in verse 12, and God said, I will be with you. As you hear God say those words to Moses, what is he saying to you? Which of those words of assurance, those, those phrases of assurance, speak most powerfully to you in whatever place of anxiety or fear you might find yourself in? Moses was indeed afraid. He was insecure. He did not want to do what he was being asked to do. So God took the time to tell Moses exactly who he is. And God's description of himself is summarized in our final set of mysterious words. In verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are say, to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God tells Moses his name. This is his name, I am. This is who he is and what he's doing and what he wants to do. And nothing will be the same from here on out for the people of God again. This is a pivotal moment in the history of the people of God. Now, I confess, I have known this story my whole life. But only in pouring over it and over it for the last month, honestly, I have just been sitting with this passage, familiar as it is, for a long time, because I know well in advance, this is the passage that I'm gonna get to preach on. Only in doing that was I actually able to recognize this dialogue because I get really kind of hung up on, you know, the amazement of the burning bush and like take off your shoes and holy ground and, and Moses eventually throws down his staff and it turns into a snake and he eventually puts his hand into his cloak. It's clean and it comes out with leprosy and then God says, put it back in. It comes out clean. Like this is all really fantastic stuff. But only as I've really sat with this passage, this chapter, have I recognized how carefully and compassionately God expresses his concern for his people and how much I need to hear those words. And I think you do too. I am sees us. I am knows our misery. I am hears us. I am will continue to be with us. And I am has come down to rescue us. He has done so, he did so with the people of Egypt, and he has done so with us ultimately through the person of Jesus. And he continues to do so. He continues to be with us as we walk through difficult days. The story of Exodus, as we go through it this semester, will continue to be exciting, fantastical, and colorful. And all of that is super important. 
But I want to challenge us from this sort of beginning of the semester to think as we move ahead that perhaps the most important words we can carry with us is the name of God himself. I am. In the times when you are feeling most stressed and wondering if God has forgotten you, I'm sure the Egyptians thought that at some time. Has God forgotten us? We've been slaves forever. We remember, I am. I am. I am with you. I hear you. I see you. So let's carry that name with us as we make our way through Exodus, but especially as we walk through these uncertain days, remembering that God sees us, he hears us, and he is indeed with us, our rescuer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks for listening to this episode of the John Brown University Chapel Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on, and we'd love it if you would leave us a review.